Thanks so much for when coming today and for finding this new room for our presentation. <laughs> for our presentations. We're, I'm Dan O'Brien, the director of the Texas School Project and the UT Dallas Education Research Center. Try putting that on a business card. <laughs> anyway, uh, I uh, and uh, we're planning on having pretty much bi-monthly, said twice a month, bi-monthly uh, presentations this semester. Kristen Klopfenstein has, has uh, graciously volunteered, or did I volunteer her to uh, to help to coordinate these presentations? So if you have questions, you can find out about the presentations on our website. As Katie, Katie's been doing a great job of, of putting out pamphlets and brochures, but particularly they're on, they're on our website as well, which is at utdallas.edu/research/tsp-erc. We're the Texas School Project and Education Research Center. But if you go to research on the UT Dallas webpage, you can find us. Under there, the Texas School Project has been around since about since the early 90s when John Kane came to Dallas, and or actually we started at Harvard for a while. I was well, I was a graduate student at the time here, and uh, and John uh, actually hired me on because I knew something about data. Anyway, I, I worked for Harvard, worked for University of Rochester, and then finally we turned it into the Harvard UTD Texas School Project, and then eventually the Harvard said. We can't really have a Texas branch, particularly one at a University of Texas. Think of what it does to our reputation. So anyway, and, and they knew me as well by that time. So anyway, we turned it into the UT Dallas Texas Schools Project, which has, which has been working ever since with all of the data from Texas Education Agency and the coordinating board and other data from the, from the state. If you have an interest in research using education data or wage data, whatever. We have lots of data that's available through the Education Research Center. We're one of the three centers that were established by the state legislature, and uh, we we're the most active center. Of the 28 projects that have been approved in the last year and a half or so since the product, pro project has been active, or the pro this process has been active, 23 of those are through the UT Dallas Education Research Center. This, is, this doesn't make A&M and UT very happy, but they, but we had a head start because we've been doing this for about a decade. One of our associates is Terry Nelson. Terry has been working with the Texas School Project first as a research assistant and then decided to use some of the data from the Texas School Project for her dissertation. She was in the Green Center when we were located over there and, and then had a, also had some uh, a cubicle over at our new facilities which are over in West New, the last three or four years that we've been over in the West Tech building as well. So she has, so I, I claim that she has uh, occupied Texas School Project space for longer than anyone else at this point, except except possibly, well, maybe Greg Branch is catching up with her, except possibly me, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and, Terry has, and Terry has utilized this data in, I think, a very interesting way in order to assess what is obviously a, a pressing and uh, policy and uh, and education, a very important to education topic for all of us, you know, which is which is uh, has been renamed a couple of times, which is now books, babies, or both, and uh, and in particular with an emphasis on Hispanic uh, Hispanic females and Hispanic dropouts and how these processes affect educational outcomes. Nathan Berg, who's who's here, the famous Nathan here, who's here. Uh, as well as uh, Edmund Terry's dissertation chair, and uh, and uh, Terry graduated. You have graduated this year. Last no. year. Last year, for heaven's sake, time flies. And is now, of course, Dr. Nelson. And so, uh, and thanks to the guidance of Nathan and her dissertation committee. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure one of the one of the, all of these will be able to answer them for you. So, Terry, thank you for presenting for us, and we, we really appreciate it. And have a good time. Okay, thanks Dan. Um, thanks to the Texas Schools Project also for giving me this opportunity and um, thank all of you for coming today. I appreciate it. Um, and happy Martin Luther King Jr. birthday today, actually today. Um, I kind of like to think that he would find this research to be very interesting. Now, just very briefly, I just want you to see this was the size of my dissertation. So I am actually giving you just a brief glimpse into some of the findings from this dissertation, but I hope they are the most interesting and important findings. Um, and I also view this, now despite the literature that's out there on dropouts and pregnancies, I view this as the beginning 
of research in Texas, because we don't really have that much on Texas. I hope that we get much more research in the future from me and from other researchers, that over time we can be begin to see a better pattern emerge of what the real factors are and a better understanding of them. Well, um, Dan has already introduced my topic and my name and, and the title, so I think I'll just skip past that. Um, in my study, I use all females who were in the ninth grade in the 1994-95 school year. And I tracked them across six years in the Texas public school system. Well, I analyzed the effect of individual demographics as well as neighborhood and high school factors on their outcomes. And these outcomes are joint, four jointly determined outcomes. They're mutually exclusive and they consist of first dropped and pregnant, not dropped and pregnant, dropped not pregnant, or not dropped not pregnant. So those are the four outcomes of the dependent variable. Now a girl was identified as a dropout if she had ever dropped out during the six years that I looked at. That's a conservative measure for dropout. And then also if she had not enrolled from one year to the next and had not graduated, then I considered that an attrition factor and for the more moderate measure, I added that to the official dropout stats. Being uh, pregnant means that she was identified as either being a parent or pregnant during her high school years. Now I'm going to show that racial ethnic differences in the dropout pregnancy outcomes can be explained a lot by demographic and contextual risk factors. Now by risk factors I mean the socio and economic characteristics of the neighborhood and the high school. And we'll see that these risk factors become disproportionately concentrated among the Hispanic girls. So, okay, right up front, I'm going to give you a summary of my findings. So those of you who, who perhaps have to leave early will get some idea. Now, initially, Hispanics appear to have higher rates of risk of becoming dropped and pregnant or not dropped and pregnant than blacks. But when I add in the contextual factors, these differences largely seem to disappear. Living at or near the border is, has large and important effects, even more so than being poor, which was surprising to me. Immigrants are actually less likely to be dropped out and are pregnant than are those who were born in the US or not identified as immigrants. By including attrition to the dropout stats to get the more moderate measure, the more expanded measure, that increases the probability of a dropout and or pregnancy outcome. Now age, another important finding, is ethnically and outcome specific. So by that I mean that older Hispanics are much more likely to be dropped and preg pregnant than are blacks. And that's for the dropped and pregnant category and for the not dropped and pregnant category. Younger girls are more likely to be dropped out and are pregnant as campus size increases. But we don't see that for the older girls. However, older girls who receive special education or services for English language deficiencies actually have lower dropped in pregnancy rates. And not having a standardized math score is a really strong risk factor. So whatever it is about these students who for some reason did not take the standardized math test, they are at a much higher risk for encountering one of these dropped in pregnant categories. And then lastly, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, attending an all-black high school actually reduces the risk of a dropout pregnancy outcome. Now I'm first going to give you a brief look at the magnitude of the issue to give a little background. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the prior research. You can contact me if you're interested in that. It's, it, it's huge. Um, I'll explain how I use the data a little bit to generate the two measures of conservative and moderate, which I've mentioned briefly. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then my results, which I hope to spend the most time on, will be largely presented to you as sort of an intuitive explanation, and not so much the statistical technical details. For that, you can go to the Texas Schools Project website where I understand they're going to post a file that contains the tables from my regressions. So have fun with that. If you have trouble sleeping at night, just open that. Um, and then I'll present some plausible explanations followed by some policies and maybe some paths for future research. Okay, well, we're probably all familiar with the magnitude of the issue, but let me just run through this briefly. 
Now for me, the topic was sort of motivated by what I was hearing in the news about the higher rates of pregnancy and dropping out among Hispanics and blacks than for whites. And as we've heard lately, researchers in just the last few years are finding that dropout rates are really much higher than the TEA publishes, upwards to 30% and even higher for Hispanics. In 1999, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Texas had the third highest dropout rate in the United States. In 1995, as far as pregnancies, one in three sexually active black or Hispanic females became pregnant, compared with one in six white females, and that's in the US. In Texas, in 1996, Texas ranked first in the number of teenage pregnancies. Just, you know, one of those statistics we really don't want to have published in the news. Now, although pregnancy rates did decline during the 1990s, we started to see an uptick uh, at the beginning of this decade. And among those declines, it turns out Hispanics actually had the smallest declines. Now, despite those declines, by 2001, in Texas, one in 27 girls became pregnant. And if we look at Bear County, and that's the county that encompasses San Antonio, we find that 15 to 17 year olds of females in Bear County were 88% more likely to become pregnant than girls in the US. And that's in, in that county, there's a San Antonio newspaper that also reported in 2002 that Hispanics were twice that of blacks and five times that of whites to become pregnant. So you can see, just looking at this, we've got something that we really need to start investigating deeply. Okay, here's the literature review, I believe, yes. And we're just gonna go right past all of that. It's extremely interesting. And we could spend a couple hours just on that. All right, so what am I doing here? My contribution. Well, first, my study is primarily descriptive and empirical. But among these contributions is, number one, a methodological contribution. Now, what does that mean? It means that in most of the research, dropout had been used, or educational attainment, had been used to predict pregnancy rates. Or fertility or pregnancy had been used to determine dropout rates. Well, there's a little bit of a problem in this kind of method. So what I did was I combined both of them together, as I explained earlier, and put them all on the left-hand side of the equation so that I could have other factors explaining one of these four outcomes. And these are all of the four outcomes, so we're really not leaving anything out. They're mutually exclusive. Using the TEA's data, I also measure the dependent variable with these four outcomes twice, as I mentioned conservatively and then again moderately, hoping to get at maybe more realistic and accurate results. So we'll see. Um, and I think, again, as more research is done, we'll start to see how this plays out because I've used administrative data to construct these measures. And that's one caveat that I think you need to understand. When you're dealing with administrative data and constructing these kinds of measures, you know, no doubt there's going to be some error in the measures. And I think whether we look at the conservative or even the moderate, the more expansive measure, we're still probably undercounting the real nature of the problem. Well, few studies that I'm aware of create a cohort that follows individuals across six years. And then adding to that collects the in addition to individual characteristics, collects high school and neighborhood characteristics that would also be important. Now, I separately measure ethnic con concentrations and language uh, characteristics in these neighborhood, uh, especially in the neighborhood characteristics. And that really comes out of literature from Marta Tienda, if you're familiar with her work, who says that by not separating these out, we're really not teasing out what might be some of the cultural uh, effects. So we'll see. OK, the data, I'm not going to talk too much about this. For the individual demographics, I use ethnicity, age, economic status, and special education, gifted, um, English language deficiencies, the geographic location, meaning living at or near the border, and immigrant status, whether or not uh, if they have a standardized math score, I use that, and if not, I indicate that they didn't have one. I also use, at the high school level, 
proportions of the high school population by ethnicity, by immigrant status, um, an economic determinant at the high school, and also campus size. And for the neighborhoods, I use percent Hispanic, percent black, percent immigrant, percent Spanish speaker, uh, percent grandparents in the home, and, and uh, economic measure in the neighborhood also. And the neighborhood information came from the US Census SF3 short form. So everything it came from TSP data except for neighborhood, which came from census data at the tract level. Well, okay, let's look at some distributions of the actual cohort, the ninth, the ninth graders that we use to look at across six years. Well, obviously fertility is a function of age. And so these pregnancy rates naturally could be in response to age, and even dropouts might be in response to some social expectations, depending on sort of your subgroup that you belong to. Now, I'm going to talk about two different age groups. Normal age, which is really those who were 15 at the start of the school year, not older than 16 by the end of the school year, or younger. So we call that normal. And above age is those who are older than that. Now, we can see here in Table 5.7 that above normal age girls are disproportionately Hispanic. 50.4% of the older Hispanics are female, that's right here, compared to 20% of blacks and about 30% of whites. So Hispanics are about one and a half times that of whites and about two and a half times of that of blacks to be older in this ninth grade population. So we can conclude from this that if age is the primary determinant of fertility, I'm going to expect to see much higher teenage pregnancy rates among the Hispanics and the blacks because so few, only 30%, are white. Now in the next table, I control for ethnicity. And what we see here is that slightly more Hispanics than blacks are above normal age. But a much smaller percent of whites, about 20%, are above normal age. So again, if age primarily determines fertility, we're going to see very different outcomes for the black and Hispanic girls because they're mostly the older girls. You have to point this at the right way. I was keep thinking if I point it over there, it will change, but it doesn't. OK, here's table 5.13 for my dissertation. And again, this looks at other individual characteristics being economically disadvantaged language needs immigrant and living at or near the border. Important individual characteristics. As we can see, 84% of Hispanics and almost 79% of blacks are economically disadvantaged compared to only about 30% of whites. Hispanics are much more likely to use the language services for being English language deficient at 33%. They're also much more likely to be immigrant, 16% in the population versus 1% for blacks and half a percent for whites. And again, we expect to see, and we do see in the data, many more Hispanics living at the border, almost 35% compared to only 1% for blacks and 3% for whites. So let me just talk a little bit. So we've seen some of the descriptive statistics of who is in the population of ninth graders. Now, this dropout, as I mentioned, comes from TEA's official dropout and dropout reason files and the lever files. And we've seen uh, all kinds of TEA dropout statistics ranging from 1% to 9 or 10%, depending on how they measure it. But if you add attrition to that, you see dropout rates closer to 40 or 50%, especially among Hispanics. Now, to get the pregnancy using these administrative data, I looked at campuses serving only pregnant or parenting girls. I used the career and technology information for single girls. I looked at the coursework that the girls took. There's courses for pregnant and parenting girls. And then I also looked at the dropout reasons to see if they claimed pregnancy is dropout. And then um, each version of the dependent variable is going to have one, the dropout and the pregnancy in it, but of course from the different outcomes. And there's the two different measures, conservative and moderate. Now, <clears throat> okay, I think I just talked about this. Um, 
Yes, we just did this. So the moderate measure, as you can see, adds the attrition to the dropout. And in the moderate measure, the pregnancy is the same as over here. So the attrition is really the only thing that gives us the moderate measure and hopefully a more realistic measure encompassing uh, dropouts. Okay, now in table 5.1, I just want you to focus in on the Hispanics. That's what this table looks at. And we're first going to look at the um, differences between Hispanic non-immigrants and immigrants. I want you to look at these yellow boxes right here first. Now we can see that the older native Hispanics, that's this bottom part, are 4.4% have a representation of being 4.4% in the cohort compared to 1.5% younger girls. So right there you see the age difference for Hispanics. For blacks, it's 3.4 versus 0.6. So it's, it's smaller. Now as far as dropping out, the older Hispanic girls, 20% were seen dropping out versus 7.8%. These are marginal distributions. So they're really a proportion in the population without controlling for all the other characteristics. Now let's look at the blue boxes, these dark blue boxes. Again, we see 3.5% of older girls who are pregnant versus 0.7 of the younger girls. That's a big difference. And 19.6% of the older girls dropped out versus just 5% of the younger girls. Again, a very big difference. In this table, we're again focusing on Hispanics. And um, what we really see here is a very interesting difference between immigrants and non-immigrants among Hispanics. Again, if you look at the yellow boxes on the right, we see that the older native, that's the poor, and then uh, poor native Hispanics and poor Hispanic immigrants have very different rates of becoming pregnant from each other. So we have 2.9% up here for the non-poor natives versus 0.4% for the non-poor immigrants. Sort of surprising, isn't it? With all the talk in the news, we might think that this number is a lot higher than that number. That's not what we're seeing in the data. And if we look at this area encompassed by this black line, these are the three most important outcomes of the four jointly determined dependent variable, right? Okay, so let's look at um, row marked number one and those red numbers. And the combined dependent variable, what stands out is that the highest rates occur among older poor Hispanics. So that's group right here. They're poor and they're older. If you compare them to non-poor, older, non-poor Hispanic natives who are even less likely to fall into one of these three categories. Now both of those were natives. If you look at the poor immigrants, they're actually less likely to fall into one of these three categories. Again, showing you that it's not just being older, it's also being immigrant that distinguishes you from the other categories of falling into one of these categories. How come there are those cells? You know, the non-poor Hispanic immigrants, for example, mm -hmm. they're pretty small. They're pretty small. Yes. Uh, yeah. A lot of these numbers are pretty small, but when you consider, I don't know how to go back. Um, hmm. I've lost my, uh... yeah, these are distributions in the data. You know, one of the reasons that I don't actually give you counts is because in some cases the counts look kind of small. And you might think, well, okay, so that's not that big of a deal. But even if you have 500 or 800 girls who are dropped and pregnant, that's still something that we need to pay attention to. And another reason I don't give you counts is that when we start looking at these percentages which give you 
a more relative way to look at the numbers, controlling for population size, if I gave you the counts, you would be able to start sort of working your way down to who exactly falls into what category. And if we ever end up in a category where there's five or less, um, I'm in big trouble. So that's another reason that I'm not showing you the counts. Of course, in this last category, not dropped out and not pregnant, that's most of them, you know, upwards of 80%. But we're okay with these people. What we really want to talk about are these people right here, even if some of them are small numbers. In the, in the hundreds or even in the just, you know, a thousand or two thousand. I think we do want to, because a lot of times they're concentrated in, in certain areas. They're not necessarily just spread out all over the state. Dan? Okay, I'm glad you ended up back at this previous slide, because when, when you look at these numbers, it looks like there are more uh, African American older uh, uh, females that are dropping out than, than there are, or at least a higher proportion of African American females are dropping out than the standard females, right? Um, for the dropped and not or pregnant oldest, category? older females, right? For the, the dropped and, and not pregnant category. So, you know, your, your findings seem to indicate that there were substantial uh, differences between Hispanic and African American. There are, when we look at them unconditionally, the raw, sort of the raw statistics, yes. And in some cases, we see a much higher percentage for Hispanics, depending on how we look at them. Immigrant age, being poor, not poor, than for blacks. However, as I mentioned earlier, one of the interesting findings is, is that once we add the neighborhood and high school characteristics, these other contextual factors, the differences between a girl being Hispanic or black and falling into one of these first three categories mostly goes away. So what you see here, it sort of says, oh, this is what we see in the population, but that's not really telling you what other factors are contributing to how they end up here. And I think that's what we're more interested in. Is that? Okay. Okay, the method was a logistic function, a computing marginal effects. I won't really go into that. You can talk to me more about that later if you'd like. What I did here instead was show you how the models developed. I first took uh, just ethnicity of the individual, and then ethnicity and age is the basic model to see what kind of results we got for the, the outcomes of drop pregnant, not drop pregnant, and so on. Then I added in neighborhood characteristics, uh, the other individual characteristics, sorry, that I mentioned earlier and then neighborhood characteristics and high school characteristics. And once I had everything added in, we had what we call the full model. So we can, it gives me a chance to sort of compare the basic model with the full model. One of the things that we see is some of these individual characteristics really do not become very good explanatory factors once we add in these neighborhood and high school characteristics. So it's less about the girl herself and more about sort of the environment that she finds herself in. Not completely, but um, in ways that are still important. Um, let's see, let me just tell you a little bit what these individual characteristics are. We have economic status that's based on the free and reduced price lunch. Um, their first TOS math score, those without a math score, I mentioned that earlier. If they have English language deficiencies, if they're in special ed, if they're identified as an immigrant, and if they're living at or near the border region. And uh, the neighborhood characteristics are a percentage of ethnic groups, Spanish speakers, um, immigrants, and percentage of grandparents in the home, and then I also have median income in there. And at the high schools, again, percentage black, percentage Hispanic, percentage immigrant, uh, a percent poor using, again, the free and reduced price lunch, and then a campus size variable. All right, I'm just going to show you this because it gets hard sometimes saying all of these categories as you're going through the results. So just try to, if you can, get in your head that DP is dropped and pregnant, NDP is not dropped and pregnant, DNP is dropped, not pregnant, NDNP, our favorite outcome, not dropped, not pregnant. Um, for the results, they're actually probabilistic outcomes, meaning the results that I get 
show the change in the probability of landing in one of these outcomes compared to what a white girl's probability would be for that outcome. Because we have to have a left out case, so that would be white. So all of these results are shown relative to whites, and I'm actually scaling them in percentage points. So I won't be talking so much about the probability of, but the increase in percentage points of the probability. All right, our first findings slide from the analytical regressions. Now here I separate the cohort into the normal age girls, that's the top panel, and the above age girls, that's the bottom pink panel. Now what you really should take away from this table with ethnicity absorbing all of the variation at this point in the dependent variable in one of these basic models is that Hispanics are more likely than blacks to be dropped and pregnant, not dropped and pregnant, uh, and dropped not pregnant. Let's just make sure that that's right. We have Hispanics here. This is an increase in percentage points by 0.138 compared to 0.002 for black. So you can see that's a big difference. Here again, for not dropped pregnant, 0.832 increase in percentage points versus 0.206. And even for dropped not pregnant, here we see the same thing. And once we add the full model, the difference pretty much goes away between Hispanic and black. There's not a big difference here. There's not a big difference here, and this is no longer statistically significant. When we look at the older girls, we see that Hispanics are 0.843 percentage points higher, uh, percentage points of, of the probability of dropping out versus blacks, about half that, 0.407. Now, another thing I want to point out to you is when we go from the conservative to the moderate measurement, so for Hispanics to be dropped and pregnant, for example, the increase in percentage points was 0.138. Whereas for dropped and pregnant using the more inclusive measure, it goes up to 487. That's a big increase. And I think that's really all I want to point out about this. You can sort of study this later and let me know if you have any questions about that. Those are compared to whites, right? Yes, everything's compared to whites. So it's not, we're not 100% sure that 0.48 is different than 0.24, right? Without, she did not do that. Well, without actually digging in. So, so when you're saying that, you've, you've done the test. Of, I, I guess there's a gazillion observations too, so everything's significantly different. Well, I, I, have, I have the significance you know, right here. These are 99% statistically significant. From white. Right, compared to what you would get for, for a white girl. So whatever the probability, if we took the unconditional probability and knew what that was, this is what we would add to it by being a Hispanic girl or by being a black girl, although for black it's not statistically significant here. So the question of whether those two effects are distinct from each other, you did run some Yes, I, ran, I ran tests. Additional hypothesis yes. tests of those two estimated coefficients. Right, I did run... I did run t-tests on those as well and found that they were largely different until you start adding in in the full models, these full models for the younger girls and these full models for the older girls, then those t-tests show that the differences also between blacks and Hispanics largely go away. They're not so that they're statistically different. Um, but they are, yes, I believe they were still different from whites because I still had some statistically significant findings for blacks and Hispanics in the full models. But the blacks and Hispanics tended not to be that different from each other once the other characteristics were added in. Is that clear? Stop so rejecting equality with the half a million observations. Uh, 150,000 observations. So. I mean, so it's still like a lot. A multinomial logic? Yes, it is a multinomial logic. Okay. A couple of, couple of odd-looking things. One is that uh, for in the top model for Hispanic uh, girls <coughs> not pregnant, that, that, that 0.173 is statistically insignificant, right? Where are you? This Hispanic drop oh. not pregnant in the top model? Right. Well, which means, that they're, not pregnant. which means that you can't distinguish that, that rate from the white rate. Right. Um, yes. And the same thing for African Americans in the yeah. bottom model. Down here? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Okay, so, so how, how big is that? Are you, say, you keep saying, well, that's big. 
but what well, is the baseline rate? Well, well we'd have to we'd have to go back and look at the the raw unconditional probabilities. Right. I can get those if you want to look at them. Well, I'm just trying to they're, get sense of They're the small. Magnitude. For here, um, I think it's about half a percent. Is I, the, the unconditional probability. So, so. Now, that's not for whites. That's for all of them. I'd have to look at it for whites. But this is compared to whites. So it this is compared to whites. Is for whites, and then you add that. So yes. this is like a three-fold increase in the probability of, or a five-fold increase, or... Right. Well, I compared them mostly black to Hispanic. Um, let me see if I have any notes on that. Well, no, it's okay. We, I'm just, just trying to get a sense of how big yeah. the effects are. Well, I think I actually did compute some of those factor sizes. So let me just see. Yeah, I have some factor sizes, but I think they come up a little bit later. And if not... I can give you those factor sizes later compared to whites. Well, these are marginal effects. Yes, they are marginal. Um, yes, unless it's controlled here, specifically in the model, then everything else is controlled at the mean. Except for whites. So we, we can talk about this more later if you want. It, let me just get through some of more of these, and then if that hasn't sort of cleared up for you how you're thinking about these compared to whites, then we can talk about this a little bit more later. Okay. Okay. I really don't want you to look at all of this table in depth right now. You can look at it later and email me or call me. But what I want you to get is for dropped and pregnant and not dropped pregnant, being at the border has a more harmful impact for the younger normal age girls than even does being poor. Th I would not have expected this. I would have expected the economic disadvantage to still outweigh being at the border because we have so many other factors taking place at the border. It's not just culture at the border. It's not just ethnicity at the border. There's a lot going on at the border. There are a lot of poor people living at the border. But somehow being at the border is more important than just being poor. Kristen, you have a confused look on your face. Well, I'm just you trying to think about what it means to be at the border. Are those people more likely to be recent immigrants? But you're saying that recent immigrants are less likely to get pregnant. That's right. So that's kind of the opposite. Of so it's something <coughs> other than being immigrant and being poor at the border. Now, what this sort of suggests is maybe it's some sort of a cultural dynamic. Well, you expect more back and forth at the border, right? You, so... So you expect you know, more back and forth, but not necessarily of the immigrants. A lot of the immigrants who are coming here with their families, their children are not going back and forth as much. It's tending to be, you know, second generation, third generation families, or second generation especially, that are going back and forth across the border to visit family. But they're spread throughout Texas. They're, they're not just concentrated at the border. So, so obviously there's a border effect going on. And I can't completely tease out what that is with these data. But if I get to you know, future research, uh, I bring that up again, that we need more regional analyses to really take a look at what's going on in these different regions. For example, the Panhandle. Panhandle area has a much higher rate of pregnancies among girls. Well, who's at the Panhandle? Well, that's a rural versus non-rural it's, it's farming. So there's a lot of migrants. A lot of migrant so families for, there. For, for no. Rural no. Urban? No. No. Not so in this. Be, you know, in terms of opportunity cost, right. That's that would be that yes. That would be another another and direction. The border is pretty rural, right? Uh, no, not necessarily. We've got some pretty big cities right along well, the border. Well, well, right, but a lot of the border is pretty rural, and that, that might be an important thing to think about in terms of. Um, what's actually going on there. I don't think that the border is as rural as we think it is. I really don't even think it's as rural as some parts of Central and West Texas. Oh, sure. So there's some of those the, some of those suburbs outline some of the cities are really you know pretty well populated, and we've got some uh, you know whites. We've got wealthy whites living down there. We have a lot of Hispanics, 
Some are multi-generation, some are recent. Of course, we have the new immigrants. But um, the thing to notice here also is that being an immigrant reduces your likelihood of the two worst outcomes, dropped and pregnant and not dropped and pregnant, which is sort of contrary to what we might think from the news. Okay, I do want to focus here a little bit more on just the drop pregnant category. And first let me mention that being pregnant or a parent while in school is a rare event. We talked about, you know, how many are they? Well, they're about 8 in 10,000 normal age girls. So we are, for this category, talking about a small number. But if we care about what happens to the population in Texas of these girls, we still need to pay attention to this. And why? Well, there are a couple of demographic factors taking place. Hispanics are the largest group of young people. They're the fastest growing group of young people. They have the highest fertility rates. So whatever numbers we're seeing now, unless we can reverse these trends in dropouts and pregnancies, this is going to continue to grow and become a much bigger problem. By 2025, I think it was Steve Murdoch when he was the Texas State demographer, uh, mentioned that we're going to have a population in Texas <coughs> of aging retirees, depending on state social services, being supported by a much larger population, a majority population of Hispanics who are young, not as professional, not as educated, so therefore not earning as much. And uh, I'm not going to say this, but some people say, you know, we're sort of heading towards an economic tsunami here in Texas. Well, maybe we are, maybe we aren't, but the fact is that the demographics are taking us in a direction where we're going to be lying, relying much more on the Hispanic population for the economic growth and sustainability in this state. We want to make sure that they're staying in school and getting into the workforce with the skills that they need so that they can earn the levels of income to have a good life and to contribute to state taxes and all of that. Okay, so here, Kristen, here's one for you. Now, before I add just looking at ethnicity, before I add the other individual and in high school and neighborhood context, Hispanics are 171% likelier than whites when you measure it conservatively to be dropped and pregnant, and 180% likelier than whites when you measure it with the more moderate measures, the more inclusive measure. So right there, we can see that measurement really makes a difference, and in forward research, we want to make sure that we really pin down these measurements better. And I have an idea for that. Okay, initially Hispanics, we saw earlier, had a higher risk of becoming dropped and pregnant than blacks. But the neighborhood and contextual factors virtually eliminate the difference, and I've mentioned that a couple of times. And being poor, living at the border, are very important effects to being dropped and pregnant. They greatly increase the probability. Being poor makes a female 5.3 times likelier to become dropped and pregnant than just being Hispanic. So there again. Poor, poor, female of any race. poor female with all other average characteristics. Yes. Than being a female, uh, sorry, than being a Hispanic with all other average characteristics. So can I push you a little on the middle one where you're saying that the, the um, contextual factors greatly reduce the Hispanic probability of being both dropped and pregnant? Hispanic and black. But it reduces the, the difference, right? So it's so yeah, there's a there greater is. difference for Hispanics. So what are the descriptive statistics such that Hispanics are somehow different, right? Clearly there's some kind of there they have some different kind of contextual experience than do black students. So what how do they look different in the descriptives? Um, well we can go back to some earlier slides. Oh just in general. Just just in general, just Trying to understand. They're poor neighborhoods, they're more ethnically homogeneous neighborhoods. Uh, so the segregation. They're more rural and they have much higher participation rates in special language services programs. Okay. Um, yeah, so. that's helpful. But as far as the contextual, there was also some interesting stuff in the census data. Um, neighborhoods. Yeah, neighborhood characteristics yeah. seem to have a distinct profile. Yeah, actually, and, and I was going to get to this, but I'll just go ahead and say now. Yeah. Yeah, median income. Um, being at a more, 
Okay, I did not expect this, but the higher the percentage of Hispanics at the high school, or the higher the percentage of blacks at the high school, reduced your probability of being dropped and pregnant for both Hispanics and blacks, for girls who are Hispanic or black. What would you? I would have expected the opposite. Why? Oh, because of the pure effect. And because when you're around, it, this is discussed a lot, but you know, I haven't seen any real measures of this. When you're around a lot of other girls who are getting pregnant, it sort of becomes okay. And I've heard anecdotal evidence of this. I've talked to teachers who taught, for example, at Addison, Addison High School sure, here in Texas. Of race, right? That would just be that you're in a school where well, lots of other but girls are pregnant. That's true. But if you go, yes, and, and I even have it where it's scaled to 100%. So I go all the way up to 100% Hispanic, so obviously you are Hispanic, 100% black, so you must be black, and attending these schools as an individual of this race, you have a less likelihood of being dropped and pregnant. Now, it could so be resources. Controlling for the total amount of pregnancy in the school, or that's, that's all in there, well, right? Because you're not really isolating it, you're not controlling, you're not isolating the race effect, if you're not controlling for well, it is measuring. It is measuring. So you're trying to get use that as a proxy for measuring the pure effects of having lots of other pregnant girls at the yes. school. Yeah. Okay, it seems like you could do that more directly just by measuring the right. You have because you have those data, right? Okay. Well, let's talk and we can yeah and run some different models to see what falls out of that. Because it just seems a little yeah. um, uncomfortable to me to be making claims about that are specific to race when it's really just the effects of having lots of other girls who, who, who have babies. Well, I'm not saying they school. all have babies, I'm saying the population. Right, no, I understand. At the school. It just seems like you could be more targeted. Okay. Well, we can talk about that later because I'm not sure that, I'm not sure, I don't think that including a rate of others in the school who are pregnant is going to help because then we're going to have... You said that was the theory, right? Well. It's, it's a motivating theory, but in the, in the model, if I put that on the, on the uh, left-hand side to predict pregnancy of Hispanics on the, the right-hand side, I'm sorry, the other way around, then, you know, I don't know what the model's telling me. So I've got, okay. well, you know, some that. endogeneity problems right there, I think. Um, <laughs> I think the point of that is to say that if you're in a high school where you're among people who are of the same ethnicity race, Let's just say that's a proxy for culture. I don't think it's a very good one, but let's just say it is. Does that mean it rubs off on you and you might be more likely to become pregnant because of ideas that circulate in the high school about pregnancy or being a mother? That's, I think, the best way to explain that. Okay, not having a standardized math score. Is that on this one? New. Well, okay, I'm not sure where I am anymore. Um, so, so it, okay, we, where did we get stuck here? On this one? Okay, we, we talked about the border effect. <coughs> you, you made it all the way through that. Okay, I made it through this one. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've seen this before, but by adding attrition to the dropout me measure, you get an increased probability of a dropped pregnant outcome. And when you go from conservative measure of dropped and pregnant to a moderate measure of dropped and pregnant, the border effect increases by a factor of 208, holding everything else constant. Gifted students, as you might imagine, and students having a higher standardized math score have a lower probability of becoming dropped and pregnant. Okay, probably no big surprise. Um, and I think I want to skip this because this isn't very clear. But not having a standardized math score is a strong risk signal. I don't remember what proportion of the population didn't have a standardized math score. I'm thinking it was about 20%. I'd have to go back and check. Dan, do you know? Okay. This is a ninth grade ninth, They're ninth graders. Is, is, is but but I look... Score at all or no, but score what I do is I look back starting from 1990 forward to see if they had ever taken a standardized math score. And I use the first one. So we still have quite a few girls who by the ninth grade still did not have a standardized math score. Now, they have a much higher 
uh, increase in the probability of being dropped and pregnant. But what is that capturing? Well, at that time, there were language exemptions, correct? There are language exemptions. And, I mean, there were a lot yes. more language exemptions. There are a lot of exemptions. Right, so right. I assumed it was that. It's, but it's capturing a lot. But what we need to do is really look more closely at these students. Who are they? Why are they getting all of these exemptions? Because they were and they're not, and that's been closed now through TEA. But the thing is, is that the, that's one of the four major signs that we show nationally for dropouts. But those are being addressed now. So I think we can continue to go around and look at I think we're variety that particular issue um, so this is really the last slide for just dropped and pregnant. Um, incorporating the high school characteristics reduces most of the marginal effects except for being near the border. So border, there's, there's really something going on there. Being exposed to an increased percentage of our Hispanic students or black students reduces the probability of drop. We talked about that already. Now, um, alternatively, if you're in a neighborhood with a higher percentage of Hispanics, a higher percentage of blacks, or a higher percentage of immigrants, you have an increased probability of being dropped and pregnant. So at the high school, a higher percentage of those groups lowers your probability. In the neighborhood, a higher percentage increases your probability. But those are so highly correlated, how does that make any sense? Well, <laughs> it's a good question. I think it has partly to do with which schools they go to. If they're going to the school in their neighborhood or in some of these bigger districts where they have choices. Yeah, because that result I, is really yes, not I haven't, identified very well. Right, I haven't teased that out. So this is an area for, this is definitely an area for more research. Yeah. So I think the point is, is that this is just what falls out when we take this first look. And it raises some questions. And we need to look, this is an area that we need to look further into. Um, after including living near the border contributes more the probability of dropped and pregnant. So I, I just keep mentioning border, 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 and you know, what else can I say about that other than there's something going on there that we don't completely understand all the dynamics there. Well, the other two outcomes, not dropped pregnant and dropped not pregnant. I'm only going to show you this slide. Incorporating the high school effects reduces all marginal effects except for being at the border when we're looking at these. Sorry, wrong slide. Um, the probability of a Hispanic being not dropped pregnant is 0.41 percentage higher than for whites. And for a black, it's 0.2 percentage points higher. So for the not dropped pregnant outcome, we don't see as large of effects, but Hispanics do have larger effects than black. And that doesn't completely go away. For this outcome, it doesn't completely go away when we add all of the other contextual factors. Now for the dropped not pregnant outcome, mainly dropouts, they're not pregnant, they haven't been reported being pregnant. We see blacks fall into this category much more than Hispanics. It's a 6.2 percentage point increase than the probability for whites and a 4.7 percentage increase than the probability for whites for Hispanics. So, I think that's all I want to say about that. And this is a review of the summary findings. I mentioned this slide earlier. Um, do you want me to run through this again? I think everybody here probably heard this at the beginning. Do you want me to run through this again? Well, let me just... Go to this. I did not examine all of these things in my study. But this comes from the literature. So if you group it, you can kind of see, well, the literature talks about cultural effects. There's the economic status being poor. There's health policy. And there's education policy. So this sort of gives you an idea of where we might go with future research. You know, we have some of these things that are sort of occurring within the individual, like how does their identity factor in? Do they identify factor with being Hispanic and being Mexican? Because 60% of the, I think 60, 60% of, of the Latin Americans here in Texas are Mexican. Also culture, acculturation assimilation process. There's a transition there. 
that can be very difficult. Maybe not so much for the immigrants, and maybe that's why my study doesn't show so much a problem for the immigrants, because maybe the immigrants still hold on to that hope for a better future. They're here for better education. They're here for better economic opportunities. Yeah, that's exactly right. You immigrate because of, of the people who cause And the selection, you're, right, you're the selection yourself. issue of immigrants it's an investment. Cr creates a, sort of a special group. But the next generation of students, they're born in the U.S. They may have immigrant parents, but they were born here in the U.S., or they may now have native parents. I think here is where the acculturation and assimilation really starts kicking in. Are they American? Are they Hispanic? What's happening to the gender roles within the family? What kind of dysfunctions are occurring in the family? And how are they doing relative to the rest of society? You know, they probably came here looking for some absolute gains, which they found in their economic standing. But the longer they're here, they start to see that their economic standing isn't so good compared to the rest of society. Their opportunities aren't so good as the rest of society. You know, how does that function in the family and in the psychology of individuals. There's a study of pregnant girls in Baltimore. They were mostly white. But what they found was this was a poor area because they had so little hope of good job opportunities and good access to better educational opportunities. As far as they were concerned, the best thing they could do in their life was be a mother. It gave them value. So I don't know, is that going on here or not? And we, of course, we also have discrimination. How much is that affecting them? Here we have economic status. These are things that are largely talked about in the, in the literature. Dysfunctional families <coughs> largely tend to be poor. There are a lot of ways that that can affect children <coughs> and their performance in school and their likelihood for dropping out. School attachment. If you are poor, and maybe if you're even going through some of these other transitional problems, how likely are you to stay attached to your school unless your school... To remember, people who are economically disadvantaged may be working or their parents are working two jobs so they don't have the opportunities to be able to be a cheerleader or a football player or those types right. of things. So that's where you need to be going that's with this, not just saying... That's a good, yeah, that's it's a good point. Um, anecdotally, I talked to a woman who's a second generation Hispanic. Or a third or a fourth. She said that when she came, she and her other siblings had to spend so much time taking care of all of their other siblings because they were large families. It really forced them to grow up fast. They didn't have time to participate in other opportunities. They had to grow up fast. They didn't, they also, if they're, uh, say, a first generation, still helping their parents getting through the system, negotiating the system, all of these things can play into how they perform and whether or not they stay attached to the school. So this is another area. Sex education, abstinence only policies. Sex education in the literature we find seems to work better than abstinence. Uh, I haven't measured this. And public health care in the medical literature seems to show that the more public health clinics you have, the more likely the girls are to use the services and to use contraception. Now, in some of these studies, they didn't necessarily control for ethnicity. So, is that true for Hispanics? You know, we need data. We need to know that. And sex education also here under education policy. And then retention policy. There's a huge literature on the retention policy, and this gets to the older girls. You know, there are two reasons that these girls are probably older. One, they've been retained, and that's the most likely reason. Secondly, we see, especially among Hispanics, girls who dropped out returning to school. Now, we have special programs for them, but if you've dropped out already, the likelihood of you not continuing, of course, greatly goes up. So they're struggling with you know, raising a family and so on. Um, even though the programs are there, they're still much less likely. But I think the retention really gets to, academically, what are we doing here? And here's some policy considerations that fall straight from my, not so much from the literature, but from my data. Um, we, we need to know who's at risk, 
and how do we target the resources to help them the most? Um, you don't actually see this in your slide, but I'll just run through what I have at note. Who's at risk? Girls living at the border. Older girls, especially Hispanic girls. Not having a standardized math test score. It's a big area for discussion right there. Living in neighborhoods with higher percentage blacks, Hispanics, or immigrants. These are the ones that, according to my study, seem to be most at risk. So what can we do? Well, we might make sure that the older girls who need special education and English language services for their deficiency there especially need to get those services because they really seem to benefit from that. Younger girls or the normal age girls do worse at larger campuses. Okay, that's sort of a you know, big expensive question right there, but maybe somebody can tell me. Um, I've heard that Louisville actually created a separate campus just for their ninth graders. Okay, so, and I read um, that based on that, they saw a pretty dramatic decline in their pregnancy rates. So take these girls that, that are normal age mostly, which is most of the population, put them in a smaller campus, they seem to do a lot better. Now I think this would probably work in districts where you have a lot of resources. So maybe they can share the resources, but they're not, maybe it's not even so much the size of the campus, but not being in the halls with 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, especially the boys. So, so, that, so maybe we need all girls schools, that's been discussed, or maybe we just need to separate the 9th graders. Well, and 9th and 10th graders, because I know that South Lake Carroll, what they do is they have their 9th and 10th grade, they have their high school, and then they have their senior high school. And so what they do is do that same kind of thing. So you have these programs, whether or not they're white students, black students, brown students, Asian students, that doesn't matter. What, it, what we need to look at is economically disadvantaged versus not economically disadvantaged. Look at Highland Park, look at South Lake, look at those programs, and look at what's being successful. And looking at your empirical data with testing currently and what the state is requiring us to do as districts currently regarding closing the gaps with special ed and with our economically disadvantaged students and that. And a movement towards smaller schools and learning smaller learning communities and building relationships, I think that's all key to inform sure. this idea of larger schools. I mean, that's a whole separate literature. Well, I mean, for doing current data, I mean, <coughs> my data, you, you know, obviously it's older data, which, which I think says that I'm underestimating. So if we got current data, and I don't mean just current TSP data, but if we could link the birth records to those data to see which of those girls are having children according to the Texas State Health birth records here in this state, then of course we could get a much more accurate measure. And then we could start to look at it based on what you said, not just regional, but by districts. What are some districts doing differently than other districts? That gets into a policy analysis. Um, we also, it would be really great to collect genera generational effects. Are you first generation, a 1.5 generation, meaning you were born here, but you have at least one immigrant parent? Are you second generation? Because I think, and the literature shows that once you get into the second generation, that's where you see the higher pregnancy rates and possibly higher dropout rates. And again, I think that gets to the acculturation and assimilation process. And let me just point out, in the literature... We've got to wrap it up here. Oh, okay. Acculturation and assimilation are not the same thing. Acculturation is, are you taking on some of the culture that you see around you for yourself? Assimilation is, does that larger culture out there accept you as one of them? It's a big difference. And with the, the darker-skinned populations, uh, we have people like uh, Puertes talking about the color line. Is there still a lot of discrimination? And then we don't know much about the preferences. There have been studies, but they're localized populations, mainly in California, and they're not always controlling for ethnicity and some of the other controls that I have. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to go, a lot more that could be done. And like I said, I really think this is just the beginning Kristen's pointed out a lot of good ideas for other ways to look at these data and tease it out. We've had other good recommendations. So uh, this is not the do-all, be-all, end-all of this problem. This is just the beginning to get us started for understanding what's really going on here in Texas.